raised funny. <clears throat> Not funny, haha, -ha, funny. Well, <clears throat> maybe, it depends on what you think is funny. It was a non traditional upbringing. I grew up in 80s and 90s, central Arkansas, as an atheist, vegetarian, hippy dippy homeschooler. <laughs> I also wore glasses from third grade on, and I had an honest to Bubba rat tail down the back of my shoulder blades until I was about 10. I'm not here to talk about my overall upbringing. I'm here to talk about my dad and cars. I love my dad, y'all. I'm so much like him that the older that I get, it's scary. Not just in his rational, measured approach to life, but Hell, we stand the same way, leaning, elbow on the countertop, toe inverted into the instep of the weight-bearing foot. I saw it last time I was home. <laughs> but my dad and I didn't always get along. We had some really rough times when I was a teenager, like pointless, nails dug into palms kind of arguments, and that's saying something considering how laid back we both are. But even at our most contentious, we could always talk about cars, the prototypes, Evolving design languages, the difference between horsepower and horsepower at the wheel, drag coefficient, and the biggie, fuel economy. It would be trite to describe my dad as complex, and even more trite to say that I'm just as complex as he is, but it's true. He came from a working class Episcopalian Pennsylvania family with what appeared to be no worldview to Jacksonville, Arkansas with the, with the Air Force during Vietnam. From there, he just bummed around Little Rock in the GI Bill through the 70s, and somehow arrived at the proto-environmentalist, animal rights, atheist, activist that I knew from an early age. <laughs> While my dad was extremely concerned about the environment, uh, environmentally detrimental effect of gas-powered horses' carriages, he was also a product of the baby boom. You know, a very emotionally attached to the idea of go fast, go far, through. Thus, my dad was extremely motivated in car choice by how far down the road a gallon would get him. Other kids' dads drove big-ass suburban monster trucks with mud-ready tires and lift kits. Remember, Arkansas. <laughs> or they drove low-slung V8 coupes that made fuel, fuel pumps tremble as they passed by. My dad, one of his biggest triumphs in the 90s was a four-door Geo Metro. Because that some bitch got 40 miles to the gallon on the highway with the AC on. So growing up, my dad was happy to let me do what I wanted, but by God, if it involves something of his, whether it be money, belongings, or time, I'd better be, be willing to work for it, either to pay for it myself or show him that what I wanted. He always made the distinction between want and need. That I wanted was a worthwhile investment in my overall development as a man. One of these educational efforts manifested itself regularly as my stewardship of the family car. I was reminded on a very regular basis that driving was a privilege and that I was responsible for everything that happened to the car on my watch. So, as part of my quest to be my dad in some way, I have been obsessed with miles per gallon since before I started driving. Every fill up is a chance to squeeze another extra 10 miles out of the tank, whether it be by judicious clutching or maybe pushing with my foot to avoid first gear. <laughs> So I arrived at 16 with my hotly laminated driver's license and a dedication to Gas Tank Chicken, which is the name that I came up with for the foolish game that I play with math and that lion ass fuel gauge. <laughs> <laughs> the first time I ran out of gas, it really wasn't a big deal. I was 16, remember? I jogged to the store, bought an overpriced gas can on my $6 an hour lifeguard wage, and moved on. I learned nothing. <laughs> I even managed to misplace the gas tank so that I, when I lost gas tank chicken again about a year later, I had to buy another one from the gas station. But hey, I was making six fifty an hour by that time, so score for me. <laughs> Dad obviously was not pleased with my adventures in fuel and gas tank chicken. Apparently, running a tank dry more than once eventually sucks all kinds of impurities swishing around in the tank into the fuel injectors, requiring them to be flushed out. So that 50 cent raise? Sacrifice to the auto shop. Goodbye, driving privileges. <laughs> so this then, when I was 17, was one of those arguments that I was talking about. I was grounded from recreational use of the car for about a month. I think I stayed mad at him for, about, uh, for ruining a month of, of my senior year of high school until I actually went to college five, years later, five months later. So this whole car thing didn't come up again until my first summer back from college. When I did, 
what is still one of the stupidest things that I have ever done in my life. My daily driver in high school, that I'd already run dry twice, remember, <clears throat> was a 96 Volkswagen Passat diesel. It got 50 miles to the gallon. <laughs> Another dad triumph. What's important here is that despite driving this around for the better part of two years in high school, one year of college book learning was sufficient to crowd out the fact that diesel engines require diesel fuel in order to carry my idiot self around. So one of my first acts behind the, the, the wheel of the 90 horsepower behemoth was to fill it with the finest unleaded premium that money could buy. I got about a quarter mile before it completely locked up, refused to move. That little mistake cost Dad $2,500 in repairs. If you guessed that I didn't have $2,500 lying around because I spent it all on beer and who knows what in college, you would be correct. <laughs> if you guessed that I was grounded for the rest of the summer, you would also be right. And I think you're figuring out that I may have finally learned something. I did. That was the worst summer of my life. <laughs> my dad was still reasonable. He stipulated that because I didn't have a job yet, I could still use the car to find and eventually commute to a job that I found. I learned that summer that I'm not suited to being a Cutco knife salesman. <laughs> <laughs> or any kind of salesman. And that the early shift at the YMCA is always in need of a, uh, a shamed former employee. And that I definitely learned that my dad wouldn't hesitate to call me out on a date to drag my ass back to the house if, he, if I tried to flout the rules he'd set in place. But more importantly, more than any other landmark in my life, the summer of 03 set pretty firmly my attitude about financial independence. Most of my life decisions in terms of job and living choices are based on my desire to never go back to that place that I was. I was humili humiliated. Not just because I wasn't able to do what I wanted, but because I felt like I had violated the last sacred ground between me and my dad. I was supposed to know about cars, and I had fucked it up by making the most basic of mistakes. I was humiliated because I had made a mistake and I couldn't be responsible for fixing it, like a child. I never wanted to feel that small again. I never wanted to have to face my dad with that kind of shame in my shoulders again. It wasn't all good deeds from then on. That dogged independence left us some pretty hefty credit card debt a few years later, but at least it was mine. And I'm pretty close to discharging it now. <laughs> as shitty as the circumstances were, this battle and its denouement are now one of my biggest sources of pride. I finished college and didn't go to law school because Largely, I didn't want that debt responsibility for a career of dubious interest to me. I took an entry-level position with the state of Arkansas because I would rather sit in a windowless cube all day than live rent-free with my parents. I stuck with the job because it allowed me to indulge myself in stage acting. I moved here to Dallas with a job because it's going to get me completely out of debt so that I can entertain the notion of maybe entertaining. All of this because a whiny 18-year-old said, no more. I'd rather you be proud of me, Dad.